Today, we have invited speakers from selected sector to share, showcase, and discuss best practices and success stories in business transformation. And we will begin with buildings and construction. To kickstart session one, transforming buildings and construction towards net zero carbon. It is our honor to have Mr. Roland Ansaker, Director of Sustainable Buildings and Cities of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development to be our first keynote speaker. Roland is now in Geneva, although he cannot join us today in person. He has recorded a video to set the scene for today's discussion. Let's watch the video now. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today about the work we do at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development on how we can reach a net zero built environment. I have been asked to reflect a little bit about the needed collaboration, but also what has come out of the COP26 conference uh, at the beginning of the month in Glasgow. I will share a few slides and I hope you can see these. So I will go through a short um, presentation on net zero in the built environment context. WBCSD, we are a global member-led business association dedicated to achieving the vision 2050. And we're working with our members across different pathways to achieve this vision. And one of the pathways within our overall vision 2050 is the built environment alongside the energy, food, mobility, and health systems. Why is the built environment so important to reach our vision? First of all, it's important to keep in mind that the built environment represents approximately 40% of global energy related emissions. That is 13 gigatons per year. It mainly comes from operational emissions. This is CO2 that gets emitted due to the energy use to cool and heat buildings. But a growing component of the emissions is from the materials, from the construction part of the built environment. And we can see that, especially in new builds, the so-called embodied carbon can make up 50% or more of the whole life cycle emissions of a building. We know that in order to reach net zero by 2050, we need to have the emissions by 2030. That means all new buildings should be net zero in operation by 2030, and they should also reduce the so-called embodied carbon by at least 50% by 2030. We work with companies from around the globe on how we accelerate this achievement of net zero across the entire built environment life cycle with collaborating along the full system. Fundamental issue in the sector is the fragmentation. We know that the built environment is a very local fragmented and also relatively short-term focused industry. And we have these silos from the design process, the moment uh, we are thinking about the project, starting to initiate it, then it goes into a construction process and then it is being operated by ultimately the end users. And this fragmentation uh, makes it difficult to drive productivity and sustainability across uh, the whole system. Last year, WBCSD uh, issued and published the Building System Carbon Framework, which does two things. On the one hand, it explains the different roles of actors in the value chain. So we have the active value chain where buildings get constructed and used, and we have emissions primarily from the manufacturing of materials and the energy use uh, during a building's life. But we also have, importantly, the so-called influencer value chain. These are companies, individuals that have influence over the full life cycle of building projects, be that architects and engineers, be that the developers or the financiers and investors who provide the capital to build. And it is at the earliest stage of any project where the influence is highest to reduce 
whole life carbon. And the second thing the framework does, it takes an agreed life cycle framework that has the building stages along the lifetime of a building and also the different building layers. And it looks at all the emissions that happen throughout the lifetime of a building from the so-called embodied emissions at the A1 to A5 stage to in-use emissions to end of life. And we need to focus on all these emissions in the built environment system and focus on how we get them to net zero through a performance-based approach that allows all actors in the value chain to align behind that same common goal. Now this year, we published a follow-up report in collaboration with Arup, and this looks at where we stand today in terms of net zero buildings. And it has taken a full life cycle approach. And the message behind this report is that we do need to account for the full emissions occurring along the life cycle of building projects. And we need to start sharing that data openly so that we can start developing benchmarks and eventually start looking at absolute targets that will allow us to reach those 2030 and ultimately 2050 net zero target. We also need to be explicit about what net zero means. And there uh, we have seen just before COP26, the issuance of the net zero standard by the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which gives us for the first time a global language on what net zero means. And we can apply that also in the built environment. And ultimately, we need that collaboration with everyone from the material provider to the construction company, to those who finance and develop uh, the buildings that we all occupy. This is an example of how a case study looks. It is important that we are able to fill in all the boxes. So from the material emissions that come from the structure, the skin, the space plan, throughout construction, then to the use phase and also end of life. What we do see is that actually refurbishment, renovation during the life cycle can have a relatively important uh, carbon footprint alongside the energy use and alongside the upfront embodied carbon emissions. So it is important that we look at all of these and that we start driving towards uh, the reduction of that number on the bottom right. Now, the study also helps us um, look at some in emerging benchmarks, both on the embodied carbon side and on the energy use intensity. Um, it is mainly looking at European work because that is where we have the data. For example, London, the Energy Transition uh, Institute, the LETI, uh, but also the GLA in London, and then several countries in Europe that are starting to look at what these benchmarks should look like in a 2030 and beyond um, timeframe. The key messages for us are to drive this idea of whole life carbon assessment, that we me measure everything and we are consistent in the metho methodologies we use, that we start developing um, these benchmarks and data, and that we start defining explicit targets going forward. In addition to the work around whole life carbon, we also looked at the specific role that investors and developers play in incentivizing the carbon reductions at the very beginning of projects. So we were able to come up with a very practical report supported by OneClick LCA on how any investor, developer or tenant can set requirements to reduce this upfront embodied carbon in projects they finance. And it does so by providing requirements, around 50 requirements that look across the cycle of a project management from a high level policy to setting requirements at the early stages of projects to going into procurement and construction. Um, it's a practical report that identifies um, how in different parts of the decision-making such requirements can be set. And the two reports together provide evidence as well as a how the building process can be influenced to reducing the life cycle emissions. Just before the COP26, um, we 
we're able to publish um, another report that looks particularly at the circularity. We know that in order to drive down the carbon emissions from the built environment, we also need to start looking at how do we reuse materials? How do we reuse components, entire structures? Um, but there is today not a general understanding yet of how we approach that, how do we account for that? And hence, Again, together with our member companies and supported by Rumble, we looked at how can we improve the business case for actually driving circularity in construction. And we started by engaging many different stakeholders around a definition. So how do we define a circular building? And then we looked at economic, environmental and social value drivers for circularity. And we have looked at case studies, we have done um, interviews and uh, also research. And what this shows is that we need more data. We need, again, more data to be shared on the value that gets created. What was visible from several of the case studies that were, um, that were looked at is that the value can be accounted for if we evolve whole life carbon measurement and also life cycle costing to address this question of the value of materials, the value of components at the end of life, also the impact of circularity on the reductions of operational expenditure during the lifetime, and also the reduction of demolition costs and hence reduced cost for landfill. If we are able to take that full life cycle costing approach, then we are better able to make that business case for increased circularity. Next steps, we will continue to um, collect whole life carbon case studies. We would very much like to um, call uh, also on you if you have or are aware of studies that have been done, we would love to look at them. We will also start looking at how low can we go? So based on this building system carbon framework, what are today the best practices, best technologies that allow us to reduce carbon emissions to a minimum already today? from embodied carbon to operational full life cycle carbon. And we will also investigate more the role of architecture, engineering and construction firms who today, to some extent, do not have the full emissions of the building projects they do on their own books, but they have important influence over them during the projects that they are involved with. So how can we also uh, increase the accountability and the responsibility to drive down emissions. I've been asked to briefly reflect on what happened at the COP26. Um, it was a, a very intense two-week conference. I think we have all seen the political outcomes that keep 1.5 alive, but also obviously have highlighted the challenges for all of us in the transition to a net zero world. Specifically on the built environment, we were part of a global coalition building to COP26 with many of our partners to really make sure that the built environment is considered in the political process. Because since Paris COP21, there was no focus on buildings and yet it is 40% of global emissions. So we were quite active across the business and buildings pavilion with events in the blue zone um, to really bring that message um, and, and, and showcase the action as well and the solutions that are there. An important piece was what are the levers that we can drive market transformation towards net zero? So how can this market, this long value chain align behind that same target? And two enablers are critical. It's to have that clarity on a common vision, 2030 and 2050, and the deep collaboration that needs to happen, including with governments, with cities, et cetera, and the finance sector. And then the three levers consisting in whole life carbon, we need to look in any project at all the emissions that occur. And we need to start looking at carbon as we look at cost. We need to start understanding the carbon that goes into construction, into renovation, into the use of buildings. And that will help us transform the dynamics between supply and demand. This sector needs the push from the demand side 
to build lower carbon buildings along their full life cycle. There is a video, it's two and a half minutes, that I would encourage you to have a brief look at. And we're very um, grateful to the Laudas Foundation to, who helped us uh, actually implement this work. So lastly, some of the key outcomes, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, this notion of a critical sector, the built environment, including buildings, infrastructure, and all that underpins our urban life. We were there with one voice, one ambition, um, that was uh, gathered and generated by all the stakeholders. And importantly, in the race to zero, cities, businesses, the finance sector were there to commit to their part of how we get to net zero. And now it is about that collaboration, uh, how, we, how we push action forward, including the full value chain, looking at whole life carbon and driving the demand. With that, I am sorry that I cannot be with you and, and also participate in the discussion, but I do hope that this was valuable for you and I look forward to any further engagements and, and hearing back and I wish you an excellent day. And thank you again that I was able to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ansiker. Moving on to our second keynote speaker, we are pleased to have Mr. Ivan Fu, Chairperson, Committee on Environment of the Construction Industry Council to deliver a keynote presentation. Ivan is now in Shanghai, but he has recorded a video for us. Let's watch the video now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Business Environment Council and Environment Series online conference. In June, we talk about redefining business leadership for green growth. Following on that, today's topic is transforming business for sustainability. In this session, we specifically focus on transforming building and construction towards net zero carbon. We all are aware that uh, following energy and transportation construction sectors is the third largest attribute for CO2 emission. We contribute 35% globally. And buildings in Hong Kong accounts for 90% of the power consumption. Never before the global world is so allied and converging in one single issue, net zero carbon. You see, we have COP26 conference. We have a lot of conferences happening recently on this hot topic. Because climate change is apparent and imminent, we all can feel it. Natural disasters happen so frequent and come in huge scale. Typhoon, floods, droughts, you It gives human society big impact and it is a big alarm. We can't wait to respond, which means we need to transform our society's operation system. How to create energy, how to reduce energy level, waste management, construction method, and so on. It is a big challenge and also it is a big opportunity for all of us, especially for those who give positive and proper response and transforming their organizational entity into something that can serve the coming zero carbon community better. It is huge business opportunity, not only for construction people, it benefits all sectors across the board, material scientists, beam wizards, blockchain, in our transactions, financial professionals, it just unfold possibilities that never imagined before. I believe we will all benefit from this golden opportunity for transforming. Especially, we have blueprints in developing our lofty metropolis, 300 square kilometers, 2.5 million populations, and together with even bigger blueprint, just cross the border in Greater Bay Area. And our government commit to place 250 billion in the coming 15 to 20 years to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050. And in mainland China, which where I am, um, the 3060 becomes also the hottest topic that you can search in Baidu under the finger trip in the internet. We need to continue our momentum in raising public awareness develop more tools and modules to shape out ecology, create more incentives to reward our good players, and more holistic strategy for seamless integration. A different player will have different role in this big exercise and we all can benefit if we can transform. 
like as Construction Industry Council, we are a proper platform to serve the entire construction community. Carbon neutrality is one of our key thoughts that gives drive and directions to our policies, year plan, and individual projects. For example, Sustainable Construction Award is one of our key events. And in the coming Expo 2022, more area and more exhibits will be for the green and carbon neutrality items. We also developed tools like Green Product Certification Scheme with more than 600 products certified and in our database, linked up seamlessly with the Carbon Assessment Tool with more than 300 projects participated at the moment and the numbers, numbers are growing. And we have our Smart Waste Management System in the pipeline in 2022. We also create incentives we work with the financial sectors and our collaborators. We work out the sustainable finance, sustainable finance certification scheme with 18 pilot projects, 20 assessors uh, for the first phase train, and seven projects obtain green loans in various format from financial institutes. We try our best to gear up the community to face the big challenge. But of course, that's not enough. We need more. We need more innovations, wider applications, more collaborations, more exchange of great thought and sharing of experience. And this is the whole purpose of this occasion. I'm very happy to see responsible entities like Business Environment Council, Hong Kong Green Building Council, Beam Society, and more. They stand up hand in hand, working hard towards less zero carbon. I trust you will enjoy today's event and bring home a lot of inspirations. Have fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fu. Before we move on to the panel discussion, I would like to remind our online participants to use the Q&A box if you have any questions to our panelists. For our audiences in the room, you may raise your hand and we will pass you the mic. Now, may I invite Ms. Edma Harvey, Group Sustainability Manager of Gammon Construction Limited, to moderate the session. Ms. Harvey, over to you. Thank you very much. Am I on? Yes, here we go. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here, and thank you um, to BEC for putting on what I hope will be a fantastic conference again. Um, let me just uh, very quickly introduce um, our panelists. Um, perhaps you'd like to just say a few words about yourself. Um, and your businesses to make sure everybody's aware of who you are, although I, I'm sure you're familiar with many of their faces. So let me start with King. Yeah, good morning. I'm Kin W.K. Leung from Hong Kong Electric. Uh, my team is operating a switch of services and subsidy uh, to help our customers and community in decarbonization. Good morning. Uh, John Hafner, I'm leading uh, sustainability for Hong Long Properties. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Pong, and I am with Shewing Steel. We are the only steel manufacturing company in Hong Kong. And as mentioned uh, in the uh, previous uh, sessions, steel is a very carbon-intensive uh, building material, and we are going to see uh, what we can do in our discussion. Hi, everyone. I'm Patrick from Swine Properties. I'm uh, leading the Sustainable Development SC2030 strategy across our global portfolio in Hong Kong, Chai's mainland, and Miami, and some other countries. So I think carbon is indeed our very important aspects of our sustainability strategy, and we're working on our science-based chart and our you know, on climate governance and um, TCFD transition risk management works to actually drive um, to having you know, a low-carbon transition in our corporate Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so we've been asked to talk uh, about transforming buildings and construction towards net zero carbon. And I just want to frame it a little bit, uh, what we're going to talk about today. So we've been asked to talk mainly about our success cases and how we're, we're seeing early results on some of the initiatives that all of the companies have been working on um, and to give some advice and some inspiration perhaps to our members. Um, we're going to look at three uh, timescales. What have we done so far, particularly in terms of um, energy efficiency? Uh, what are we look working on now in the present? And what, we are, what we're going to need to do in the future in terms of reaching that net zero carbon target? And also to look across the, 
the three scopes. So scope one, the direct greenhouse gas emissions. So in the context of a building operation, it might be gas for water heating. Scope two, the indirect emissions that, of course, um, come from the purchased electricity and all of the electricity uses within a building. And then the indirect, um, the other indirect greenhouse gas emissions, and particularly the embodied carbon of new buildings, the tenant emissions, which is, which is uh, often a challenge, and things like the waste and wastewater um, also generated uh, during the construction process and the operation of the business. And we'll use the term upfront carbon. Upfront carbon is the, the combination of the embodied carbon in the materials that are embedded during its manufacture and its transport, and then the, the energy used during the construction process. So that's the upfront carbon. So we'll be using these terms perhaps in this discussion. I just wanted to make sure we were all clear on those. So let's start with the past then. What has been successful so far? And let me start with John, if you don't mind. Um, what, are some of the, what are some of the successful strategies that you've used in your buildings um, so far that we can, that we can ta use to tackle operational energy efficiency? Sure, thanks, Emma. So um, I guess I could give a few different examples, uh, and I'll also just talk about our process more generally. Um, with respect to examples, um, our property, uh, Riverside 66, has done a very good work in operational control uh, optimization of chiller systems and and managed to reduce uh, electricity consumption by almost uh, 30 percent um, in 2019 relative to 2015. We also had uh, in Center 66 we did uh, air conditioning optimization that reduced summer consumption by again more than 25 percent. Um, and here in Hong Kong, uh, Amoy uh, Plaza just received an award from CLP. Going back to the earlier uh, discussion about how we all need to be doing more in energy efficiency. Um, and that was, again, uh, related to uh, children optimization and water balancing and using technology. So we have a number of examples where we can see that if we look at the entire process of energy consumption in the building, that we can find opportunities for optimization. What we've done more recently is we've standardized the process of how we think about this. We have an annual greenhouse gas mitigation plan that has to be approved by our vice chair. So it goes all the way to the vice chair, who um, is my boss, uh, Adriel Chan, leading uh, sustainability at the board level. And every property has to contribute their operational reduction plans towards our annual uh, KPI that's set for electricity consumption reduction. And so the logic is that the individual contributions of the properties have to together add up to the annual target. And we just started this process last year. So we had our first greenhouse gas mitigation plan with the systematic addition of every property. Um, we introduced um, um, normalization measures. This year, we're going to be looking uh, in January, how do we do this year? And we'll be doing this annual adjustment. So we brought this annual rigor to the process as well. So it's not just ad hoc, but I would emphasize the importance of taking a systematic approach and making sure that each year you either achieve the KPI that you set for that year or you make corresponding adjustments accordingly in subsequent years. Thank you very much, John. Um, and Patrick, can I also ask the same question uh, for you at, at Swire Properties? Yes. yes, sure, Emma. I think as a real estate developer, you know, managing 25 million square feet of you know, green certified buildings you know, globally, um, you know, carbon emissions and energy reduction is indeed uh, one of the most important systems we expect to take care of. Um, despite we have spent a lot of effort, you know, Actually, having or almost 100% of our buildings are now, you know, certified green buildings to, you know, like beam plus and lead standard. I think we, it's not enough, right? You know, you're just doing that green certification does not does not get to the you know path we needed to uh, commit it to the you know net zero vision and 1.5 degrees Celsius. And and that's that's indeed the, the strategy that I want to raise is that you know how how we can lead from the top from the climate. Uh, from the climate governance and also on, in terms of target setting, you know, how we work with our individual buildings globally to have the same vision, to have the same goal. And that's where our science-based target come into play. I think um, um, quite recently we have our latest 1.5 degree um, science-based target approved by science-based target initiative, which is very encouraging for the whole firm. And, and that's actually helped us to align every single building in a building stock here in Hong Kong, Chinese mainland, Miami, wherever, um, to actually set a very aggressive energy reduction target, EUI, by 2025 and 2030, because our science-based target requires us to actually uh, reduce by 23% by 2025 and reduce by 46% by 2030. That's a very aggressive target. 
but you know how to how we should work with the building is that you know through the vision, common you know climate vision, we we actually communicate with them, and also give them you know this target, and you know also identify ways actually to explore very innovative solutions to help the buildings to meet the target. And um, there's our science we start also you know look at you know scope free emissions uh, up both upstream and body carbon. I will come to that later, and also downstream um, lease access. There's tenants emissions, and having that target is a, an important first step, and it actually help us to you know keep on innovating. You know, and researching and come up with new ways to to uh, identify ways to you know improve our carbon emissions. And one of particular strategy example is that we we work uh, with a lot of different partners, in particular with Tsinghua University, where we have a very long term um, partnership on a joint research center on building sustainability, where we you know using our portfolio as a you know living lab basically to research on some new technologies and we share the results with the industry. So. In 2020, we are very proud to see we have, you know, already achieved over 108 million, you know, uh, electricity cost savings in 2020 in a single year compared compared to the base year. So there's a very, you know, good bottom line savings, you know, for doing all this. Uh, but we don't stop here. And adding on John's comment, a lot of, you know, different building innovations have to continue. And two things that are in the pipeline is that, you know, first of all, is we're launching, you know, a global portfolio of smart energy, smart energy uh, management platform using a lot of, you know, different technologies like uh, AI and um, uh, digital technologies actually to help us to automate the process of optimizing the building performance, especially for the existing buildings, which, which we need a lot of, you know, retro commissioning and also some automatic process to optimize the operation. And secondly, in uh, Taiku Ali uh, Sanli in Beijing, we're innovating a new uh, so-called direct current uh, microgrid system, utilizing much more uh, renewable energy like solar powers and a fuel cell storage system where we can actually change the DC system, in, uh, sorry, AC system in the DC system, where we can improve the energy transmission uh, efficiency much more. So uh, I think all, doing all this is also supported by our green finance strategy, where we have a lot of you know, green L bonds and loans to support Let me and all that. jump so. in there, Patrick. Sure. You're going to take over the whole session if we're not careful. <laughs> You're obviously doing a lot. You raise a good question. <laughs> Let me move to, to Keen. Um, from a power company uh, how, uh, perspective, how have you been uh, assisting owners and uh, uh, building operators to uh, make their improvements in terms of energy efficiency? Yeah, actually, uh, if you take account that 90% uh, of electricity in Hong Kong uh, is used at buildings, together with other scope one emissions from uh, vehicles and also use of gas for water heating at buildings. It, roughly two-thirds of greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. Uh, we are providing uh, service and subsidies to assist building owners in decarbonization. For example, today, for every building owner, you must know your carbon position today and project what will be your position by 2050. Uh, we are providing free energy service to building owners to check uh, how they perform in terms of energy efficiency in the communal areas. And we also provide energy service for tenants. Uh, for example, uh, we also, after that health check, uh, we will provide subsidies to implement, for example, retrofitting projects, retro commissioning projects, and also smart technologies projects. Recently, we supported a, a, a quite a successful case. Uh, our building owners, uh, we ram their chiller control system and retrofitting some uh, sensors to control the chiller water and the chiller uh, sequencing by AI. They can achieve 10% energy saving. The payback is around five years. If you, if you have a current chiller system, that's there will be 10 or 15 years uh, before the life expiry, then you, you will not be, retrofitted or replaced by a new one. Then retro commissioning plus uh, smart technology is the way to go. Yeah. That's uh, very useful. Um, thank you, Keen. We've had a question actually that's come through and I hope that um, from Sam, and I hope that uh, that's given you some ideas. It was about the exact solutions to reduce carbon. So we've already, we've already had some examples there from our panelists. Um, Samantha, can I just move over to you then? 
because you're a slightly different uh, business as an industrial operator, have you also uh, been looking at the operational process and uh, of your the operational energy in your manufacturing process? Um, we are uh, m most of the steel in Hong Kong um, are well, actually 100% are imported from everywhere in the world, from Turkey, from China, from Vietnam, from India. So um, if we want to reduce the, the carbon emission, we're, we're really talking about the upfront carbon, which we will address later. But what we have done as um, an operator, as a, uh, uh, an oper a steel operator in Hong Kong, is that uh, we, we went back to uh, the whole, um, uh, the, the R's. Remember the reduce, reuse, recycle. So going back to um, that, um, we want to reduce the steel, the re reinforcing bars used on site. So, but we're not um, you know, the engineers or we're not the, the architects, so um, that should be really be done at that stage. But what we have done um, on our part is that we uh, started um, off-site fabrication, prefabrication on, 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 um, in our factory. So what that does is that reduces uh, the wastage on site because imagine if all the rebars are delivered to um, the on site and then uh, the cut and bending are done cutting and bending are done on site then the the wastage can be as high as seven or eight percent so by doing that in a factory uh, setting on site um, in in our factory what we have been able to do is we've been able to reduce the wastage by quite a bit so that's um, step one but step two would be what we will be discussing soon. Um, should I move on to that, to what we are currently trying to do, or you would like to Let, lead that discussion? Let, let's, yes, <laughs> let's move on a little bit. Um, so uh, let's bring it up to the, the present, as it were. So what are, you, what are we focusing on now? What, what are the, the short-term actions that you've been doing that you can rec recommend to our, to our members? Um, let me start again with John. Um, what, what are your focus areas at the moment, and how important is the collaboration piece that, that, uh, in, your, in your operations? So we're f we've been focused on, uh, we had announced uh, last year our 2030 targets, a set of 2030 targets, including an ambitious uh, target to reduce our scopes one and two greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2030 relative to 2018. Um, we've been now focused on developing a set of 2025 targets. And we're going to be announcing 25 targets by 2025, so it's easy to remember. Um, later this, actually this month, it's already December, isn't it? So, um, and, and uh, I think seven of those targets uh, relate to climate resilience. Six of them around uh, emissions reduction, one on the adaptation side, just as an example. So full agreement that um, it's very important to set targets. And, we, and it's important for us that we had 2030, now we're going to have 2050. So that's number one. Number two... Um, among those targets, I'd highlight a few in particular that are relevant to this discussion. One is around green leases. So we're developing an initiative, to your point on collaboration. We want to collaborate with our tenants around uh, how we can work together around sustainability, in particular emissions reduction. And we often speak of this as a sort of Venn diagram. We look at our own sustainability commitments. We look at the sustainability commitments of our most significant tenants. There's significant overlap in the middle. So it's no longer a question of convincing our most significant tenants to care about sustainability, or they don't need to convince us. It's about how can we work together. Another area of focus is around um, renewable energy in particular. Um, and I was wondering how much to say about this because we just had a very significant development. So I'm gonna not go into too much detail, leave a little bit of suspense. But um, uh, later this month, we'll be, uh, we'll be announcing our first uh, uh, full, fully powered by renewable energy project on the mainland, one of our properties there. So we're quite excited about that power purchase agreement that we've undertaken. And that is something we want to do more of as well that will obviously help significantly. So it's not just about the intensity of the electricity, but also the sources of electricity. So um, those are just some of the initiatives we're working on. Thanks, John. Um, and uh, I jumped in there. Uh, Patrick, earlier on, you were going to talk, I think, a little bit about finance because that, that c plays a, a quite large part in, in how you're delivering some of these green ambitions. 
you yes. want to share a little bit on that? Yes, actually green financing goes hand in hand with our carbon reduction strategy because uh, since 2018, we launched our first green barn, you know, 500 million US dollars. And, you know, all of the proceeds now have been gone into a lot of green building works, in particular renewable energy installation and one, one tackle place to tackle place, for example, and also on some climate resilience works that we've been doing. And also in 2019, another example is the sustainability lake loan we launched with the bank. And basically, that's very, you know, uh, heavily linked to our sustainability performance and also linked to the UI target, as I said, you know, it's linked to the UI target that we have set for our Hong Kong portfolio. So when we meet that target, we enjoy a, a margin reduction for the loan structure. So now our Treasury Department actually go with a lot of works, actually established these loans with a lot of different banks. So up to now, we have, uh, you know, around 30% of all green finan uh, financing coming from green financing. And we do enjoy a lot of, you know, uh, a margin reduction for, from doing this and also, you know, from our sustainability performance and the UI reduction targets that we met. And we don't, don't stop here. We, we want uh, our, our finance director want to, you know, raise their target to 50% by 2025 and then 2030 by 80%. So it's a long way to go. And that means, you know, our portfolio understand that you know all the works they they're go gonna be put on a budget will be supported by by finance department and also by these finance in instruments and also by, by the investors and the banks and and so on. So this is a, a good strategy that goes hands in hand with our climate strategy. So um, we we heard from Roland that uh, there is an ambition from the World Green Bank Building Council to hit net zero in operations by 2030. Do you think that's going to be possible in Hong Kong? And I'm going to actually ask Kim, <laughs> because um, obviously there's a part to play from the electricity suppliers. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what's your view on that? Yeah, actually, I, I think it, it, it can be possible. Yeah, first of all, uh, we, we're serving Hong Kong. Uh, we, we should look at two sides, supply side and demand side. On demand side, we are decarbonizing our electricity generation. Uh, in early 2030, we will replace all the coal-fired units by natural gas. By that time, uh, the carbon attached to our electricity will, will be reduced by 50% uh, as compared to 2005. We are also planning for offshore wind farm in southwest of Lama Island. If this project is realized, each year we can produce 400 million units of zero carbon green energy. And on the demand side, uh, we are working in two directions. The first one is uh, energy efficiency, smart use of uh, electricity. Just like I said before, we are providing services and subsidies to help the owners to reduce energy consumption. The another direction is electrification. Uh, this point I want to bring out is the some, some, sometimes we, we have missed out these important directions. Uh, we have to electrify all the end use, uh, replacing all the end use fossil fuel. By then, uh, we can achieve carbon neutrality. And on the supply side, we decarbonize the electricity generation. And on the demand side, we replace all the fossil fuel used by electricity. For example, we replace diesel in diesel generator at construction site by grid power supply. We replace the diesel and petrol used in ICE of cars by battery electric vehicles. And also, we are promoting to replace a gas heating by heat pump. This is the way we, we are working with our uh, customers and stakeholders uh, to achieve carbon neutrality before 2050. It is quite ambitious, 30 years it will pass in the blink of eyes. Yeah, indeed. And it's, um, I'm grateful for you mentioning um, the, the construction sites, actually, because this is uh, something that is close to my heart, of course, um, being from, from Gavin Construction. But it's also an initiative that BEC has been working on um, under their Low Carbon Charter, um, the Power Up Coalition. So if there are uh, particularly developers, architects, contractors out there who are not yet part of this, um, we're really pushing for early electrification um, and also, you know, long-term decarbonisation of the actual construction process. So we would encourage you to, to join um, and we've, we will have some news about that, I think, uh, in early next year. So let me move on then to Samantha. Um, 
talking about uh, embodied carbon. Um, we know as the grid is decarbonizing and the operational efficiency will improve and the operational in, uh, embodied, sorry, operational energy consumption will de decrease, the embodied carbon is going to become much, much more important. So do you want to share a little bit about uh, what your company is doing yes. in that area? Um, so two years ago, um, I, we started looking at embodied carbon. Nobody knew what was that, what it was. Just, I, I, Upfront carbon, it, was, it wasn't even a term, I think, especially in Hong Kong. I talked to uh, my um, clients, um, you know, all the construction companies. Uh, some of them are aware, but they, they were not prepared to do anything about it at that point. Um, I think Gammon was one of the first that we spoke to. And Gammon was um, very um, uh, forward-thinking in, 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 in terms of this. And also, um, Swa and, and Hang Long. It just, it just so happens that... Uh, um, the the panels on today. So, um, so steel um, steel making itself is um, it, not, nothing has changed. It's still very uh, carbon intensive. Um, a lot has been done to try to reduce the carbon emission. For example, in uh, Sweden, there's a plant that uses hydrogen as a reducing agent, and it uses clean energy. But um, it's, it's a great initiative, but then to be able to um, produce at a meaningful um, scale, it's going to be very expensive. Fortunately, steel is also endlessly recyclable. We can recycle steel you know, at infinite times, and it doesn't lose um, the strength or the um, uh, ductility um, or any of the, the properties of those properties. So the other way of steel making is um, through the electric arc furnace, and that's used to use uh, recycled um, scrap. So right now in Hong Kong, a lot of the steel, and I'm happy to report um, that this year, a third of the steel imported to Hong Kong is from um, EAF. Uh, that is a significant increase from previous years, especially be uh, between, I would say, 2005 and 2016. Um, almost 90% of the steel uh, was from China. And the, the steel from China at that point was all through the traditional uh, steel making process, which is um, uh, BOF, the uh, basic oxygen furnace. So what we're doing now is we are trying to encourage um, um, contractors to actually say in the um, tender document to, or actually not just the contractors, but also the, the owners, developers, to say um, the steel used, the reinforcing bars used um, for this project should contain at least 70% recycled material. So that's being done right now uh, by some of the developers. Uh, but, that's, but I think it, it takes a bit of um, uh, education and we've been doing that um, through BC, through the Green Building Council, through other associations. We're trying to educate um, the industry what embodied carbon is. And just to give you, um, uh, as for reference, uh, the traditional steel making route. Uh, per ton of steel, we're talking about up to 2.5 tons of carbon dioxide emission. Whereas through uh, EAF, uh, it's about 0.95. So that's a huge reduction. And if we can actually achieve that, then um, the embodied car the upfront carbon um, uh, of a project can be cut because steel is such a, a pillar material uh, in construction, especially in Hong Kong, uh, steel and, and concrete. Concrete, a lot of work has been, has been done, is being done. So steel is the next uh, Hot material, I suppose. Yeah. So that's 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 what we're we're trying to do. We're also um, trying to make sure when we procure uh, rebars from everywhere in the world, we try to pick um, EAF mills. Thank you. Um, there's a question that's come up uh, that I'm going to ask Keen in a minute, but I just wanted to open it up to the floor. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I'll, I'll keep going for a while. But are there any questions that um, you'd like to raise in the meantime? I've got one at the back there. Let, let's take that for, for now. Thanks, Jill. Thank if you'd you. just like to tell us your name and your 
your organization? Hello, uh, Hugo from uh, Clestra. Uh, my question will, will be mainly directed to uh, Mr. Hafner and uh, Mr. Ho as property developer. Um, what are the main technologies or construction methods that you're considering uh, when it comes to retrofitting older uh, buildings uh, in your portfolio? And that's it. Thank On you. Retrofitting, you mean the existing buildings retrofitting? Existing buildings, yes, and, and um, uh, upgrading them and making them um, uh, you know, more sustainable uh, in their operation. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. this in terms of systems or also maybe the envelope of the building? Construction, envelope, and systems, yes. I, okay. Patrick, do you okay. want to start off? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, but one, one thing we are piloting is using more you know, digital train technology with BIM modeling to actually, mo you know, mo actually modeling how, how the retrofitting and, and you know, enhancement work would be done. What was that impact to the energy efficiency, efficiency and energy consumptions and the carbon emission, et cetera. And also, I think in, in terms of retrofitting, we're also trying to do a lot with the tenants to actually challenge them you know, whether a lot of your retrofitting products can be reused or resell. So we're, we're partnering with a, with a technology firm actually now doing a lot in our Taiku Place portfolio is that we, we would collect you know, all of the you know, items that they don't want and put it in a, in a, in a shed, uh, remodify them, and actually promote them to incoming tenants uh, for, you know, if you want some, you know, secondhand, which is still very nice furniture, you can still reuse them. And if, if they're not being sold, we will, you know, give it to charities. I think that's just the way that we try to educate our tenants, you know. You, you don't need all things brand new, right? You, you, you can reuse, it's always the, you know, the biggest Im impact for reduction on car in carbon. And John, anything else to add? Um, yeah, maybe uh, uh, thinking about uh, prefab prefabrication might be another example that we're looking at in construction. And also, um, um, I mean, this is a, a technology that's got a lot of attention already in Hong Kong, but um, uh, replacing uh, um, the use of uh, amped, amped energies uh, technology to replace the use of diesel on construction sites as a kind of storage technology, so that's a minor one. But when it comes to retrofitting, it tends to be quite specific to the building, what technology we may end up using. Anything anybody else would like to add? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I, I can give a word on that. I, I think first of the thing is, you, you must know your existing uh, building position, carbon position. Uh, but without data, you cannot do that. The first of all, you, you may need to retrofit some IoT sensor submitters to measure how uh, is your building is performing. And, and then you then apply AI, machine learning, all sort of control uh, technologies to uh, re-engineering the operation of the whole buildings to achieve higher energy efficiency. That, that's my point, yeah. And I'm gonna stay with you, thanks, thanks Keen. I'm gonna stay with you because um, there's a question that's come through that, said, that says, uh, if energy providers are planning to keep the costs of electricity as low as possible for consumers, and perhaps this is referring back to what Richard was saying at the beginning, how can consumers still be incentivized to use less energy? It's a very <laughs> interesting question. It is, uh, uh, I think Mr. Lancaster has answered uh, in a very good way. Uh, I just supplement that. Uh, I attended a conference maybe three years ago. Uh, that's why Hong Kong people uh, didn't want to save energy because the energy price is too low. It is quite honest. When you compare your expenses in the pie chart, it consumes less than, say, less than 3%. Yeah. Uh, there was a joke. If we, we increase the, uh, the energy price by three times, then everyone will save energy. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But nowadays, I think everyone is cautious about climate change, carbon neutrality. And uh, at present, each unit of electricity is attracted with certain amounts of carbon and also other form of energy, uh, gas, diesel, all attached with an amount of carbon. If you care about your mother earth, your next generation, then people will, will move on to safe energy. This is my feeling of especially younger generation. 
they are quite cautious about their future, green future. So I'm quite confident that uh, even at present reasonable price of electricity, they will save energy. And, and is there perhaps a role of, uh, for investors and shareholders to play in that? Yes, think? I think added to that, a great kin, but also, you know, as a business to get prepared for the climate transition, I think we will have to start looking at the carbon pricing impact. You know, of course, it's not, it's not, uh, not doesn't exist yet in Hong Kong, but in, you can see the China is going up so quickly at the, you know, it's a tradable commodity already. So it's very likely that, you know, this can come into play. And then if you look at the utility consumption and what is the carbon price behind to look at, you know, more, more long term, you can already, you know, so much incentivized to actually reduce your, 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 your utility consumption to mitigate that risk in, in future. And, you know, if you're talking to banks, talking to, you know, putting up loans for you, they will definitely ask you, you know, what, what is the impact? You, you need to get that risk assessment and what are the projections of that, you know, carbon pricing to, to your business operations and to your supply chain and so on and so on. So I think this is already, you know, there, this is coming up some new risk that help you to incentivize that. Yeah. I can see that Edwin has the microphone, so I'm guessing he'd like to ask a question. Edwin. Yeah, thank you, Emma. Uh, Edwin now from the Green Earth. Now, um, I would like to know that the energy consumption of an entire building tower is not just from the landlord side, that what equipment you have provided, but also on the tenant side that they occupy the building for, I mean, the whole day and they use the energy. So what sort of percentage of the landlord side and the tenant side, the energy consumption percentage, is it 50-50 or a lot more on the uh, tenant side? If that is the case, will the landlords, the property developers, to work with the tenants and give them, them some significant incentive, even though the electricity price is, is quite low in Hong Kong? compared to other cities, to attract them, to drive them to really save the energy throughout their occupancy in, in, in your building. And I think that would be giving a quite a significant carbon reduction if that can be done in Hong Kong. Thank you. John, do you want to, I know that you've been talking about green leases, which is, I think, talking sure. to Edwin's point. Yeah, um, so just a couple things. Uh, the question of incentives is an interesting one, and, and, and to be honest, we're having some internal debate and discussion around it, but some starting points for us are the fact that if our tenants, particularly significant tenants, already have sustainability commitments, they've already made those commitments publicly, then they have an incentive to meet their own targets already, just as we have an incentive and we're holding ourselves accountable against our own targets. So even just creating the conversation for collaboration and saying to them as a landlord, we recognize that you have these commitments and we do as well, let's work together. There already is a strong uh, incentive, let's say, for the, for the tenants, at least our most significant international tenants to achieve what they're, what they're committing to already. And so there's a natural responsiveness to that. They don't necessarily need an external incentive. Second, if they're going to be saving money on electricity, that's a further incentive. So. Um, you know, the, we're, we're, we're not, we're, we're passing on, in, in the mainland, uh, we, we bill our tenants in, in Hong Kong, it works differently, but we, the, the, the price of electricity we pass on to our tenants is the price of electricity they've consumed. So, so they should be simply enjoying the savings on that uh, consumption as well. We are thinking about recognition schemes, but we're trying to get away from the idea that there has to be a further financial incentive beyond the commitments they've already made and beyond the electricity savings they've already achieved. But I know there's a debate about this. Yeah, I just want to add on um, addressing Edwin's question. I mean, tenants is of course the major users of buildings, and they constitute around you know f forty to sixty percent, depending on building where they're shopping more office building. But that's that's a major part of it. So I think um, we we have. I just want to quote one more example. You know, when you talk about the building life cycle, right? You know, the tenant tenancy life cycle. So it's very important that you know when you have a new tenant, or incoming tenants, that you can already you know help them to to you know design a office or or a retail shop as green as possible, as low carbon as possible. Otherwise, you know you can do all the energy audit, but it's still the, the infrastructure to build built in as well as so we lock in some you know inefficiency in, in in the design. So so we have. Uh, 
already doing some programs like you know Green Kitchen Initiative. There's a very successful program in this one to two years where when the incoming F and B in more tenants, we provide some sort of technical guidelines uh, to help them actually design and you know uh, renovate the kitchen and the whole you know restaurant to be as green and low carbon as possible. And we have you see them. Many of them have already enjoy a lot of uh, electricity cost. Also have a fresher and more you know well ventilated kitchen, and it's, it's good for the staff to work in, and also you know good branding for for the restaurant you know because they're a green kitchen. So we keep monitoring these, uh, and we also raise. Up, uh, you know, benchmark figures. We because we have a lot of restaurant uh, participating program. We can benchmark the performance, so you know, tenants at the same time also know where, where they sit and uh, where, where they compare the performance. So I think these will want to exp explore to roll it out to more of the tenants in the future. That where we can you know uh, work with them uh, in many different ways. And I think this is one of the collaboration I want to mention. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to bring the conversation back towards embodied carbon again. Um, Particularly because um, the gentleman from WBCSD, Roland, he mentioned about the specific targets on embodied carbon. The, there was the study and the different um, targets that had been set. Do you think there's a place, I'm going to ask Samantha this one, do you think there's a place in Hong Kong for us to also look at embodied carbon targets for building and even infrastructure? Um, Definitely, and I think it's not. Um, I, we we can't escape from that. I think we need we need to set a target, and then we need to um, achieve that. Uh, maybe not. I won't be as impressive as um, other targets, but I think that is that 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 has to be has to be done. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the two major materials um, for construction, uh, concrete and steel. Concrete. Um, is being done, um, and the uh, low and body carbon concrete. I think the compared to the traditional um, concrete, we're talking about about a forty percent reduction in the body carbon. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe not that generous. Okay. <laughs> More. Fifteen maybe to thirty percent. Maybe we should we get. Do we should get to moment. forty. Yes, we should. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas uh, for steel. Um, it's actually not that difficult to bring down from you know 2.5 to uh, 0 0.95. So that's that's what 55-60 percent reduction. Um, and but that takes effort. It's we as um, our previous uh, speakers were saying we need to align our efforts. So as a supplier, I am doing my part. But if there's no demand, then I I can't procure perhaps slightly more expensive uh, rebars just to be um, accountable as a supplier. So we really need um, everyone's effort uh, from, we're talking about from um, developers to contractors to the government. Perhaps there should be legislation on this. Um, uh, for, for example, uh, earlier I mentioned um, off-site cut and bend yard. So there are projects in Hong Kong right now that require at least 70% uh, of the rebars to be fabricated off-site. So maybe uh, the same can be done for um, the, the source of the material. Um, but I think that's going to take a bit of discussion from all stakeholders before we can achieve that. But I, I, just to answer your question, I think it can be done and it needs to be done. I think... Um just to wrap up, actually, I should finish now. But anyway, just for, I'm going to just run down the line. Is there anything else you'd like to to add before we close, Patrick? Yeah. yeah one right. one second. Oh no, one, <laughs> one, fifteen Bam. seconds. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no, just getting back to Sam, Sam's point. I mean, sending a market signal is important. So as as a real estate project, we have set our science based target for embodied carbon as well. By 2030, we have to introduce by 25 percent, and we specify in our main contractor contract for low carbon concrete and steel. And, then, and I hope that send a market signal to that, you know, uh, so our properties need that. And, and that will help actually uh, slowly we see more project and more products coming into play. John? Yeah, yep. yeah um, I also would support a market signal. I think we should consider having an emissions factor adder on the imports. It would make life so much easier. Just price the pollution on when we import it. That'll take care of it. Then we don't need to add tons and tons of specifications because there'll just be a natural alignment for the lower carbon steel. We've set an embodied carbon target uh, ourselves for 2025. 
Um, it's comparing the building against the same, the alternative version of the same building with substituted materials and substituted material quantities. And that's going to drive us forward. But in a nutshell, Hong Kong needs to think about its scope three emissions, its import, to the, the, the carbon of its imported materials into the city when it thinks of its own decarbonization. Yeah, that's a whole, whole new uh, topic, I think, that we could talk about a lot. Keen, any one, final words? One minute. Th oh, no, okay. go on right there. Uh, so you, you know buildings has a lifespan of about 50 years. So today you must make a decision when you plan for a new building. And young and new buildings definitely will survive beyond 2050. Even with zero carbon electricity, there's still some residual carbon uh, for the end use of fields and buildings. For example, just F&B restaurant, you're using gas for cooking or water heating. So today when you plan for a new building, you must have a clever choice of fuel strategy. Uh, how you can achieve carbon neutrality before 2050. If you make a wrong choice, you have to make up your, your put some more money to retrofit back to uh, uh, zero carbon buildings. Yeah. That's, that's my, my, my advice. Yeah. Okay, anything Sam to finish? No. Okay, I'll hand over to Violet. Thank you very much indeed for your contributions and for your questions. So over to you, Violet. Thank you, Ms. Harvey and our speakers for an insightful discussion. This also brings us to the end of the first session. We will now take a 30-minute break before the next session on logistics and supply chain, which will start at 12. Thank you. <laughs>